Thank you very much, uh, Mickey Huff and Matt Witt and Jonathan Reed and President Lieberman for uh, the invitation. You can see how fast 20 years goes. <laughs> Speaking of time, uh, I like to say to students that uh, they have about 15 to 20,000 days uh, in their active life and 2,500 weeks or so. Did last week go quickly? And most people think yes. And so the lesson of that is not to waste your 20s trying to figure out who you were when you were an adolescent and to have a high estimate of your own significance in advancing justice in the world because that's the great work of human beings on earth. Without justice, there's no liberty and no freedom. And my subject today is to try to <clears throat> demonstrate that ordinary people have always done the extraordinary things throughout American history. And all the great changes, abolition of slavery, women's right to vote, the whole farmer, labor, progressive movements in the late 19th century, uh, and the more modern anti-war movements, environment, consumer, labor, in the 20, 20th century. They all started by a handful of people who often never were active. They had a sense of injustice and they were motivated and they respected themselves as citizens. They didn't just give up and make excuses like they don't have time and they don't like to be criticized in public and so forth. And they made history. And even at the peak, with the exception of the Civil War, even at the peak of the movement, civil rights movement, women's rights movement more recently, uh, there never was close to 1% of the people actively engaged. That's all it took. 1% or less actively engaged, a couple hundred hours a year, connected with each other, maybe supporting some full-time small citizen groups. 1% or less uh, it takes, as long as A, they have their facts in order and know how to argue the case, and B, they represent public opinion. That's the key. If they represent public opinion and there are tremendous changes in this country that can be made already supported by conservative and liberal public opinion, which you almost never hear about in the news because all you hear about is where they dislike each other or they oppose each other, reproductive rights or school prayer, gun control, uh, etc. But in major transformations of living wage, full Medicare for all with free choice of doctor and hospital, cracking down on corporate crime and abuse against consumers and patients and children and uh, taxpayers and workers, breaking up the big New York banks that comes in at 90% because if they're big, too big to fail, as conservative columnists once put George Will, they should be too big to exist. And criminal justice reform, left-right support on that, already getting legislation through to reduce some of those absurd uh, jail sentences for teenagers caught with a little few drugs in their hand. Uh, there's a great support for civil liberties. Uh, conservatives, liberals don't like the uh, restrictions in the Patriot Act or the people, police can search your home, not tell you for 72 hours or going to your medical and financial records, and invading your privacy, on and on. And once you get a left-right coalition going on members of Congress or legislature in Sacramento, it's over. It's an unstoppable political force. I've seen it happen in Washington. When conservative liberals go into a senator's office and say, we want you to vote for the Whistleblower Protection Act, blowing the whistle on corporate fraud on the U.S. government. They don't know how to handle it. They know how to game the liberal. They know how to game <laughs> the conservative. <clears throat> it's over. And so don't let anybody tell you this is a highly polarized society. It's highly polarized by design in areas of opposition between left and right. I just gave some examples. What's in the interest of the two major political parties to divide and rule. That's the way they raise their money, by being on one side or the other on some hot button issues. 
But the issues of convergence and agreement, <clears throat> they're not there. Uh, they, they can't handle that politically. They can't go to their liberal fundraisers or their conservative fundraisers and say, we're on the same side together. Oh, no. And that's something we have to keep in mind in terms of how fast we can get <clears throat> long overdue change uh, in this country. And that includes, by the way, the bloated military budget, criminal wars of aggression abroad, being the policeman for the world and only making it worse, creating more enemies. We're ingenious in Washington, creating more hatred in other countries against us. What started out as a criminal gang in Northeast Afghanistan attacking on 9-11 has now gone into 25 countries with all kinds of sub-chapters of Al-Qaeda and ISIS and so forth. That's what we've gotten for $3 trillion of your money, dead U.S. soldiers, traumatized U.S. soldiers, over a million dead Iraqis, millions sick and injured, spilling over into other countries like Syria uh, and Somalia and so forth. <clears throat> so we have to get serious. There's always a time for fun, uh, but if we're not a serious society to a critical mass of time, we are going to be a deteriorating society. We're going to be controlled by our own low expectation levels. We're going to be controlled by money and politics, nullifying our votes. We're going to be controlled by shutting, out, shutting us out of the property we own, like the public lands and the public airways. We own the public airways. We own the public lands. But corporations control them and turn it against us. And as a result, we grow up corporate. In fact, uh, if there's anybody here who hasn't grown up corporate, they're either from Finland <laughs> or Mars. Because we all grow up looking at all those TV ads and so on that describe the economy, the food, the autos, the insurance policies, the banks, the way the, the corporations want us to see it. When I was growing up in Connecticut, uh, I saw my share of automobile ads on TV, and they were only the ads showing style and horsepower and glamour and psychosexual appeals. They weren't ads talking about fuel efficiency, safety, pollution control, ease of maintenance and repair. Forget it. I never saw an ad for mass transit. I never saw people in a nice mass transit car reading the paper, snoozing on their way to work, parallel to a clogged LA highway where everybody's shouting rage at each other, right? You never see that, right? Well, no, no wonder there's not that much support for mass transit going back years. Uh, just let me give two illustrations of where citizens were active in California and where citizens were not organized in California. The first was 1988, when I was asked to come to California because auto insurance rates were going through the sky. And there was no reason for it other than they got away with it. We had a weak state insurance regulator in Sacramento. And so we started a campaign with Harvey Rosenfield and others. We weren't more than half a dozen people. And we informed the LA Times and others what we were doing went all the way up and down the state and qualified an initiative uh, to regulate auto insurance prices. Because at that time, there's no regulation of auto insurance prices in California. The industry got wind of this. They couldn't stop us from putting it on the ballot, but they spent $70 million to beat us, except we beat them. And in 1988 to now, According to the actuary, J. Robert Hunter, very respected man, this has saved California consumers a hundred billion, billion dollars. And California went from one of the highest auto insurance prices in the country to one of the lowest. That's because a handful of people with the facts, communicating, and reflecting a majority opinion to motorists. They even got a rebate. They even got a rebate. 
Now go back earlier in the 1930s and 1940s when the trolley industry was the last remaining competitor to the auto companies. They wanted to sell more cars. If people use trolleys, they don't buy cars. Los Angeles had the largest electrified trolley system in the world. Whole arc around LA. I used to call it the red car. And they got together, GM got together with an oil company and a tire company. They all wanted to sell their products. And they bought up the LA trolley system and tore out the tracks. They closed it down. So they could build more highways and more cars, tires, and burn more gasoline. They did this in 25 other cities all over the country. The Justice Department prosecuted them for violating the antitrust laws, and they convicted them, including GM, in federal district court in Chicago in 1948. And the, the fine of what some call the economic crime of the century, because you are paying for it right now in congested highways, they fined General Motors 5,000 bucks. That's it. Crime, corporate crime pays. And people are suffering from that all over the country. An imbalanced surface transportation system, heavily, heavily, heavily on highways and fits and little spurts of public transit here and there, hardly reflecting modern public transit technology, to say the least. There were no organized opposition to that. And they rolled the politician and they got away with it. So it starts with our expectation level. Does it surprise you to learn that the American people have the lowest expectation level of the kind of country that they live in, of any people in the Western world? Tell me to prove it. OK, here we go. We all study Eugene Debs. How many people know Eugene Debs, right? The great labor leader in the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, he was so popular that when he took a train from Philadelphia to Chicago once to uh, speak to an open air rally and 150,000 people showed up. This was no smartphone text meshes, period. You know. People showed up. At the end of his career, he ran for president four or five times. I, I synchronized with him. And, and he opposed World War I, uh, just freedom of speech. And Woodrow Wilson had him prosecuted and put in jail, and he got a million votes for president while he was in jail. At the end of his career, 1920s, a reporter came up to him and said, Mr. Debs, what's your greatest regret? And Debs looked at the reporter and said, my greatest regret? He said, my greatest regret is that the American people under their constitution can have almost anything they want, but it seems like they don't want much of anything at all. Wow. You think that's no longer the case? Watch. Western Europe, 1945. Devastated. End of World War II. Huge unemployment. Crushed cities. Abandoned countrysides. You can imagine what it was like. Out of those ashes, with a multi-party system in these countries, not two parties, with strong labor unions, strong consumer co-ops, like food co-ops, they established the following services paid for by the taxpayers. In other words, they got something for their taxes. Tuition-free higher education. No such thing as student debt. Full universal health insurance from cradle to grave. Paid maternity leave. Paid child care. Paid, paid family sick leave, sometimes for a year. They got decent public transit, inexpensive. They got well-kept parks. They got support for the arts. 
They had a higher minimum wage. They had pensions. They had paid vacations, four to seven weeks now. That's for everybody, not just people who belong to labor unions. We don't have any of that today for everyone. See the difference in expectation levels? 